Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Episode 2 of the Puppet Playhouse Podcast, or PPP for short, or simply <laughs> Now, in our pilot episode, I spoke about how I got into acting, specifically at local community theater. This week, I thought I would move on to puppetry. I mean, this is the Puppet Playhouse Podcast, after all, right? It would be kind of weird to have a podcast with a puppet in the title and not speak about puppets. Well, let's go. Now, like so many kids, I discovered puppets through television. You now, even with the limited TV viewing that I had access to as a kid, puppets did come across my screen. PBS gave me shows like Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. CBS gave me Captain Kangaroo. And I'm sure there were others, but these were shows that I distinctly remember watching as a young kid. Each one, of course, had puppetry, and that was where I caught my first glimpse of the craft. Back then, my father was also the youth minister where we attended church, and some of his youth group were involved in the puppet ministry. So I got the best of both worlds. Being a kid, I could watch the puppet shows in children's church, but with some of my dad's kids working in the puppet ministry, I also got to watch them put the shows together, and so I got a behind-the-scenes look at what went on. And that is what solidified my love of the craft, so that when I finally graduated Children's Church at 10 years old, I immediately asked to help with the puppet ministry. The rest, the rest as they as say, they is say history. history. Now, in my teenage years, I discovered The Muppet Show through reruns. And by then, my dad had bought us a satellite receiver. That's one of those giant dishes out in the yard. And she can move the various satellites into the sky and you get all the cable channels. And the Muppet Show was a major influence on my puppetry back then. The larger than life, over exaggerated personalities where you would instantly know who the character was and what they were like when they came on the screen. I wanted the puppets that I performed to be like that. I wanted to interact with not just other puppets, but real-life people like the Muppets did with their guest stars. And so I began to adapt to that style over time. But even as I got older, I never looked at puppets as anything more than a hobby. You know, something you did at church. I never looked at puppetry as a form of acting, something that we talked about in the pilot. And yes, for you puppeteers out there, fresh faces or old hats... Puppetry is a form of acting. Now, think about this for a minute. What do you do as an actor? Well, you're given a role, this character, and you bring it to life. And through your vocal inflections, tone of voice, mannerisms, movements, you strive to get the audience to suspend disbelief and accept that you are not you anymore. That for the length of time that they see you, whether on stage or in film, you are that person you're playing. Well, what do we do in puppetry? Pretty much the same thing. We're asking the audience to suspend disbelief and accept that the puppet is a living, breathing, real thing. That it's alive. That it may even have feelings. That it can think and reason and make choices. And how do we do that? Well, through vocal inflection, tone of voice, body movement, language, all that sort of thing, right? However, acting wasn't on my radar back then. So I didn't make that connection, at least not until I had graduated high school and got my first real job. So a family friend was moving his business out to Colorado Springs, Colorado, and he had gone out of his way to do some sightseeing. And he was visiting the historical district, Old Colorado City, and he came across a doll shop, Simpich Character Dolls. Now, for some of you listening who may be into doll collecting, I'm sure you might have at least heard of that name. Well, while visiting the shop, he overheard the cashier talking to a customer about the puppet theater next door. It turns out that the owner and founder of the doll shop, well, his son was a professional puppeteer and had opened a small string puppet theater next door connected to the shop. And he was interested in expanding the business, which meant he was going to hire puppeteers that he could train. And then he would focus on creating new shows. It took him roughly a year to create a show from beginning to end, as he did most of the work himself. Now, not only did he create each puppet by hand, but he also would paint them 
He would sew the clothes, create the props, paint the backdrops, the music scores, almost everything he did single-handed. And having staff to run the theater, well, not only performing the shows, but also uh, selling tickets, acting as ushers and hosts, well, that would give him the free time he needed to bring more shows to life. I remember him telling us early on that he needed a new show ready in the theater every six months. Well, my friend heard the conversation, and he immediately inquired to the cashier. Well, he just happened to know two puppeteers back in Alabama that where he was from, you know, and he took down some contact info. Was it long after that that I received a phone call? And he heavily encouraged me to at least inquire about the job. My family friend recognized my talent, well beyond what I did at the time. I was still looking at puppets as a hobby, something I did for children's church, nothing more than that. It was fun. Now, remember how I said my friend knew of two puppeteers in Alabama? (laughs) Well, the second one would be my brother. Back in junior high, my brother began helping me during children's church. He went through that phase, as we say, where he wanted a break, where he was too cool to work with puppets. But after a while, he eventually came back around, and we've been partners ever since. Puppets were always something that he did enjoy doing, but it was never beyond the hobby. History was his first love, and he eventually became the local historian and genealogist at our local library. Now, I say quite often, he's probably forgotten more about local history than many of us will ever know. He's that good. Well, as for myself, I decided to make that call. And as we've said before on this podcast, the rest, rest, as they say, say, is history. history. After a handful of phone calls, I was asked to come out for an in-person interview with a request that maybe I wouldn't have to leave after I had the interview. (laughs) So I was now on my way, and I did get the interview. I did move out to Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I was under the employ of one David Simpage of David Simpage Marionettes. So I moved out, began my new life as a professional puppeteer in June of 1991. Now, the first show that we were doing was Beauty and the Beast. And that was more akin to the actual French fairy tale, because Disney wouldn't release their animated theatrical film until November of the same year. Now, there were four of us who were hired, and we divided up into two teams who would learn a show and perform it together. However, while the other three puppeteers, they were learning fast and growing faster within the string puppeteer craft, I myself was stuck in neutral. They shut out the gate like rockets and were well on their way, while myself, (laughs) I was going nowhere fast. And I had no indicators as to why that was. For weeks and weeks, I would ponder and I would ask myself, well, what's going on? And my boss, David Simpich, would routinely say that my performance felt empty and flat, that he felt like I was just going through motions. And I was. You know, puppetry was something that I had always been good at. The big guy upstairs has blessed me with that talent. And so when I hit this massive roadblock, believe me, I was concerned. I thought my job would actually be in jeopardy. And this went on for weeks and weeks. I had zero answers as to why. And it wasn't until we started rehearsals for the next show that things actually started turning around. As Beauty and the Beast was near closing, we began rehearsing our next show, which was Tom Sawyer, based on the book by Samuel Clemens. And to this day, I can't explain what happened. Now, we were rehearsing at rehearsal studio and had had a replica puppet stage, identical to the one in the theater. And at some point during those rehearsals, a light bulb just went off in my head. And, and suddenly, just like snap, I was performing. I wasn't just going to the motions. I was becoming the characters. I was acting And, well, at this point, one might assume that the rest rest is history, as I say. But no, no, it wasn't. (laughs) Well, two of the puppeteers 
of the four announced over the holidays that they were going to leave the job after the new year. And the prospect of having to train two new individuals, uh, that didn't really set too well to David. Plus, he had only just begun to feel comfortable not being at the theater. And so one day he asked me to meet in private and he told me that he was going to close down the theater, that he had decided to take his shows out on the road, that he would travel across the United States and perform at various venues. And of course, well, when you're performing on the road, that eliminates the need to have a theater. And I suppose, in retrospect, thinking, well, you know, traveling to new cities, well, that would give him an entirely new audience. So he wouldn't even need a brand new show near as often as he would were he to stay in the same spot. Now, one thing he said to me to this day, I still carry it with me. And I know that that is what has helped keep me looking at puppetry in a different light, much more than a hobby. Now, he did remind me in our conversation, you know, that when I started, the other three puppeteers shot out of the gate. They were learning and growing fast and furious. Of course, we're paraphrasing. I don't remember his exact words. But just as whatever clicked in my brain had turned itself on, well, they plateaued during that same time period. So they shot out fast and went pretty far, and I stayed in neutral. But eventually... They plateaued. They reached a particular point and leveled off. And for me, he said, well, just like they did, I shot out of the gate. But he said, I shot past them. And I kept on going. And he didn't know how far I could go. Now, before we move further, I just want to take a minute and make certain that this doesn't look like that I'm bashing my fellow puppeteers or that even my boss David was. No. He was just offering his own insight and opinion, not only as a boss, but as one of the best string puppeteers in the world. And like I said in the pilot episode, I think, he has the awards to prove it. And I do not mean any disrespect, and he didn't either. I mean, that was 30 years ago. So <laughs> what would be the point in doing that now? And well, I want to pause for a moment here. Because maybe someone out there is trying their best at a particular job and it's not working out the way you thought it would or the way you thought it should. And you can't really pinpoint or figure out what's going on. And maybe it's that job that you just knew. This is perfect for me. This is my wheelhouse. Well, that was me. And I can relate to being frustrated and confused for weeks on end because I was. Because I knew in the back of my mind that I was giving 110%, but I was going nowhere fast. And to that, I want to say, don't give up. Keep on keeping on. Because, see, I could have thrown in the towel. And believe me, though I didn't really say it earlier, I was considering it more than one time. I would call home regular and talk to my family. I may just come home. I mean, I'm not doing what he wants me to do, and I don't know why. But, you see, I didn't. And I know that if I can get through it, you can get through it. Now, Let's return to that conversation I was having with David and my skill. And let's say, you know, I carry that still to this very day. And I've never come close to losing my love of puppetry. But it did give me the confidence to go beyond the hobby. Now, with the theater closing and me being out of a job, I decided, well, I'm just going to move back to Alabama. And as you should now be aware through this podcast or my YouTube channel, I still love puppets and I perform them on a regular basis where I attend church. But I also received an amazing opportunity, which I spoke about in the pilot, being the puppeteer for the PBS show Steve Trust Science. For that, Steve, he was encouraged to involve some puppetry on the show for marketing. Because if you've worked with PBS, any money made doesn't come from the network. It comes from marketing. So working under a tight budget, he decided to uh, throw what you would call a Hail Mary pass in football, right? He reached out on Facebook and asked if any of his friends knew of someone local in the northern Alabama area who was a puppeteer. Now, quite a few of my Facebook friends were his Facebook friends, and they recommended me to him. And I'm not on Facebook regularly, like every single day. I and mean, if I am, I certainly don't, you know, do a religiously scrolling through my feed. But something said to me to log in and scroll through on a Sunday afternoon. And I did. 
And when I saw that people had recommended me, I reached out. Now, initially, Steve was looking for someone who could lip sync to a pre-recorded vocal track. And I met for an interview, and I was able to do a little more than lip sync. And here's where we can throw another one of those, the rest, rest shall we shall say, is history. <laughs> you know, I gave up on coincidences a long time ago. And I want to credit the big guy upstairs for getting me to log into Facebook that day so that I could be made aware of this opportunity. Because, let me tell you, it is a blessing times a million to work with Steve, who is an amazing, amazing talent. And it's also a blessing to get to spread laughter and smiles and knowledge and good vibes through that show. Just like I said on my pilot podcast, season two is on the horizon, but money, it takes money. And I want to encourage each one of you who are listening to this podcast Go out and watch some of season one of e Draft Science. You can find it on the main PBS website, pbs.org. You can find it through your local PBS station. And if they don't carry it, well, just go online or write them a letter, ask them to carry it. You can watch it on Chromecast, Roku, even YouTube, just YouTube Steve Crest Science. He's got episodes on his own uh, YouTube channel. But watch some episodes and let others know about the show and let them watch it and make up your own mind. And if you like the show, you know, and you happen to have money, because I think there's someone out there that might be willing to be a Steve Trash show sponsor. Now, I know if you've watched PBS, you have seen the ads before and after sponsored by, and then you get whatever corporation or whatever. I know that there's got to be someone out there listening that would love to be a Steve Trash show sponsor. Because it's a show with positive messages, science facts, cool magic, puppets, music, fun, and more. <clears throat> but we would love to bring you new amazing episodes. But the wheels don't turn without money to burn. Hopefully you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about my puppetry journey. And as we are speaking about puppets on today's podcast, I thought we might hear from some of my puppet friends who just so happened to come by the studio on the very day this was being recorded. <laughs> Ooh, imagine that. <laughs> so first, this is a good friend of mine who works part-time at the Car Palace. His name is Daryl, and um, Daryl is, shall we say, unique. Yes, uh, he got lost in his own bathroom two weeks once. So let's give it up for Daryl Mulligan! Well, hello there, Daryl. Welcome to... <clears throat> hello. <laughs> you know, like, I am happy to be here because, you know, like, <clears throat> is like, you know, like, saying, <clears throat> is like, you know, like, <clears throat> it's cool. <laughs> well, I'm glad to know that it's cool for you, Daryl. So for all the people listening across the United States, maybe even the world, tell them a little about yourself. Daryl is Daryl. Daryl works at the car palace for Mr. Slick. Mr. Slick is from Chicago, and he came here to what he calls Hooterville and sells you skies. Well, we're not in Hooterville, Daryl. That is actually the name of a town from a classic television show. I think Mr. Slick is just letting all of us know just how different it is down here from where he was living in Chicago. But it's not all bad. I mean, he did choose to stay here and open up a business. Mr. Slick lives in the Underwood, Petersville, Cloverdale metropolitan area. Yeah. Um. So, okay, Daryl, what is it that you do at the car palace? Are you a receptionist? Are you a car salesman? A mechanic? I mean, what's your specific job title? Mr. Slick says that Daryl's job is whatever Mr. Slick wants Daryl to do. I enter phone, I clean, I watch cars, I do what Mr. Slick wants. I see. But um, you do get paid, right? I mean, what, what do you get paid? Uh, well, are you hourly? Are you salary? Daryl gets paid two fifty an hour. Whoa. Wait. 250 bucks an hour. How can Slick afford that? No, 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 no. You got the number wrong. Not two fifty. Two dollar and fifty cents an hour. Daryl got the raise last fall. <laughs> a raise? 
$2.50 is nowhere remotely close to minimum wage, you should be making at least three times that amount, if not more. Mr. Slick say, if Daryl sell car, Daryl can have commission. Then Daryl make more money. And something tells me that you don't get out onto the lot very often to try and sell a car. Well, Daryl, I hate to cut the interview short, but we do have another guest to get to, and time is running out. I'm so glad you stopped by, my friend. Now people across the globe, well, they'll know about you and the car palace. Hey, maybe you can get another raise or 12 since you gave Mr. Slick all of this free publicity. Daryl have question. Why this called a podcast? Daryl not in a pod. Two peas in a pod. Pod person from outer space. I pod. You pod. We all pod. Pods? They're cool. <laughs> Bye. And thank you very much for that, Daryl. Let's give it up once more for Daryl Mulligan, everyone. <laughs> Let's just hope that he can find his way out of the building. Okay, so my next guest is someone who is actually related to my very first guest in our pilot episode. Now, for those out of the loop, in our first episode, we had my friend Roscoe Motrin stop by. Well, today we have his very own aunt. So let's give it up for Aunt Nelma Ziffel. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I'm just so proud to be here. And we are so happy to have you on the show, Aunt Nelma. Now, I want you to tell everyone what you do in your spare time. You mean knitting? Oh, I only took that up because they closed the senior center because of COVID. No, 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 no. I mean, before that, you know, what you got famous for? Famous? <laughs> Boy, I ain't no more famous than that Mr. Slick is generous. And we all know how much of a penny pincher he is. Oh, okay, okay. Well, Locally, you might say, you, you could be considered um, famous to certain people, right? Well, I reckon I might be at that, but I don't take to no bragging about myself. Oh, I totally respect that, Aunt Nelma. But I just wanted everyone listening, you know, to know, because you're quite an inspiration. Well, at least I think so. Well, now on that one, if my story can help somebody out there live a better life, I'm all for it. My name is Nelma Ziffel. I'm 93 years old, and I used to be the Tri-County Buck Dance champion. It used to be. Wait, wait a minute. What happened? Well... You know, I discovered buck dancing years ago. Eighty-four is when I discovered it. Years, that's how old I was. I practiced and practiced, and finally, all these years later, I worked my way up to the championship, and I actually won. But having an old lady with a crown didn't sit too well with some folks, so they brought in a ringer. A spry young thing at 72 year old to beat me. And she did. I was all set to go after my title again when this COVID hit and shut down the senior center. They called off the competition until next year. Oh, ouch. I'm sorry to hear that, Aunt Nelma. Hey, hey, but that really doesn't matter. Okay, the thing is, you didn't let your age stop you. I mean, you started dancing in 84, won the championship at 92. I mean, you found bug dancing, and you enjoyed it, and you decided to go out on the circuit and compete. You know, and I thought that might be an inspiration of folks out there. Maybe there's there's something they've been wanting to do, but they're not sure about doing it. Or maybe they're afraid to take that big risk. Maybe someone is telling them that they shouldn't take the risk or that they can't. I thought your story might inspire them. And maybe you might have a few words to say about it. Well, sure I do. Everybody gets a little scared now and then. That's part of being human. But what you learn to do is use that fear. 
Make it work for you instead of against you. Oh, it ain't easy. You don't know how many folks back home were telling me how crazy I was for trying to buck dance at my age. Not only to dance, but compete. They said things like, we don't want to see you get hurt. Which, that is true. I was 92 year old at the time going for the championship. My body ain't like it used to be. I ain't no spring chicken and I admit that. But I also want to live life on my own terms whenever possible. I want to do what I can do as long as I'm able to do it. Ah, I see. So now how did you use that fear as you say? Um, may, how did you make it work for you? Well, ain't no single one form that's going to work for everyone. But you got to believe in yourself. No matter how old you are, if you want to do something, you got to believe that you can do it. Even if others think you can't. And then you try. You know, it really is that simple. A body won't know what they can do until they try. You may do good, or you may fall flat on your face. But at least you'll know one way or the other. So, um, what if you hadn't been good at bug dancing? What if you had not started winning competitions? Or what if you got hurt in the process? You know, fear is the lie that tells us we'd better not try because we don't want to be disappointed or hurt. Now, I won't lie to you. I didn't want to be laid up with no injury. At my age, I might not recover from it. At least not fully. And I could have gotten out there and made the biggest fool of myself. But you see, when you don't try, you just exist in this world. And I ain't one to just exist. I know plenty of people who do that very thing. Oh, I love that, Aunt Nelma. And, well, we're really short on time here, so is there any parting advice that you want to give anyone out there? I sure do. Don't let anyone define who you are. Learn to love you for you, and that'll help you with the fair so that you can accomplish whatever it is you want to do. Oh, it ain't gonna be easy, I done said that. But that just makes it all the more rewarding if you succeed. And remember, there's only one you in the universe. So you be the best you possible. Cause living with regret can be worse than the fear you may be dealing with now. Very wise words, Aunt Nelma. Thank you for stopping by. And I hope that someone out there can find value in what she said. Fear in its various forms is something that we all struggle with at some point in our lives. Yes, even me. Like not knowing how this podcast would be received. Would anyone care if I did a podcast? And many times the phrase, well, why bother, came to my mind. But I took the plunge, and I decided that if, if only one person found something valuable from what I do, it was worth the effort. You know, we let fear control our lives in a lot of ways. And um, I say, I'm just as guilty as the next. And may all of us be more like fearless Aunt Nelma. Now, before we go today, I want to once again thank Daybreak Digital Studios for the amazing editing and the help in finding a much better microphone than what I was using as well. Now, they can help you with recording and the production side of all of your audio needs. And if they can't do it, they just happen to know the best in the business who will be able to do it. So remember, never goodbye. Always good journey. 
This is William Freeman signing off.